Today's event is all about gardens and gardening in Gloucestershire. John's here to tell us all about that. I, at least I hope John's here. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, there he is. Yeah, right. I'm here. So um, with no further ado from me, over to you, John. Tell us all about it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Well, thanks, folks, for coming. Um, so, yeah, this talks, uh, we're looking at sort of gardens and, and the, the archives we've got that relate to gardens around the country, both big and small and everything. We were originally going to try and expand it into farming as well, but suddenly realised that was far too big. So we're going to save the farming one for a later date um, but we are going to look at orchards um, but before that let's look at the oldest plants we can find in the county this is a bit of a cheat to be honest because the oldest plants are not above ground they're in the coal measures of the forest they're fossils um, so the fo forest coal measures late carbon for us about 309 million years ago where the area was sort of near shore into tidal swamps of estuaries and things really must have been really interesting um, and the coal was formed when the vegetation died formed peat and the areas are compressed into coal the forest coal isn't the thickest in, in there but it is is there and it came to the surface in what we call the risk and origin which is a massive collision of continents which we created the uh, moors of Dartmoor and Exmoor and, and lots of the mountains around Brittany, that sort of thing. Um, in the forest, lovely little bowl, the coal measures pop up so you can get plants. And the picture in the top right there is, is, is a plant that you can find. Um, certain places have more than others, but they are quite interesting. So that's a little bit of an aside, really. Let's go leap a, leap a few million years forward. John, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. And we yeah. get much better sound quality when you're leaning forward a little bit. Okay, I'll lean forward. It's much that, clearer. So if you don't mind just getting yourself a little bit closer. No, no, I can do um, that. Maybe just, just slowing just down a little bit. Yeah, I can try it. So we'll say bump forward a few million years, a few 300 million years, to be honest. First mention of an orchard and garden we have in the archives. Um, it's in the archive of the Kingscote family of Kingscote down in the south of the county. And they're one of the oldest families in Gloucestershire. And it's a deed that's gifting a house in evening. And the house has an orchard and garden. Now, the whole place was owned by the convent and holy trinity of Caen in France. And it was gifted by the abbess um, to William, son of Nigel of Kingscote. In either 1180 or 1220, we're not quite sure. The document itself is undated, but we know there are two abbesses called Joan. Joan the abbess is mentioned in this document. So, and there is first one was 1180, second one 1220. So it's around about that sort of period. Um, again, written in Latin, hard to read if you don't don't know any Latin. But um, on line four there, if you have a look down the line four, the third word in is pomerio. Um, it's misspelled both to say pomerium, and so it means an apple or tree orchard. And the next word along is actually auto, but that should be hortus for garden. So it's a little bit of um, shortcutting there, you know, a bit of abbreviation there. But it's, it's a lovely document, very well written for its age. Um, the first named orchard, okay, which is slightly different, is uh, appears in Orr in 1498, so quite a bit later, and it's named Bother's Hay. Um, and it's in this document, I've just highlighted it there, it's, it's quite a scrabbly one to read. And it's agreement made by John Bailey of Baystow with John and Margaret Flower of Orr, and it concerned a tenement and adjacent land in Shetwood in Orr, and also an orchard called Bother's Hay in a parcel of arable la land. Um, we think it's probably somewhere near Shepherd, Shepherdine House in Orr. Um, and the actual name Bothers Hay might imply there is a dwelling and enclosed by a hedge. So Bothy in Old English means a dwelling. Hedge could be it's hay or hay. So, you know, it seems like there might have been a, a structure in this orchard. Um, Orchards are shown in different ways in the OS maps, generally as nice straight rows of deciduous trees. Sometimes they're smaller than the sort of the proper planted woodland. Um, but they're shown in lots of other ways. Um, so this is an example of, of the um, map of the um, D6E4, we call it. So it's property um, of the Nibley family uh, down on the for forest area. So you can see on the left hand side, there's this sort of orchard by the Nords. You can see the relative straight lines. But if you look on the other side, which is about you know, a quarter of a mile above it, you can see it's a little bit more wavy. So they tended to use the scattergun approach for woodland straight lines for a planted orchard or a planted plantation, to be honest. Um, and of course, the Vale, as you probably all know, is, is a real stronghold for orchards. Uh, and this is just a quick map of showing you, this is it's the area just above all, in fact. And you can see all these orchards here that goes down the whole way and 
also, of course, up into uh, bandit country in Worcester and Hereford. Sure. Um, if you're lucky enough to own an orchard or if you've got an interest in one, I thoroughly recommend to have a look at the Gloucestershire Orchard Trust website. Lots of information there about how you can manage them. There's also lots of information on the heritage of the orchards and their, and their fruit in there as well. So I can't recommend those enough. We're looking at formal gardens. Um, Usually they were termed pleasure gardens and they were like a standard requirement of any gentry home, really sort of upper class to upper middle class, the middle classes and lower classes didn't generally have enough space for it, obviously. Um, but we got great Bain in Gloucestershire here, we were Boone I should say, um, 64 of the sort of the country seats were drawn by Johannes Kipp, the, the famous um, sort of engraver and print dealer and he was commissioned to draw these gardens by Robert Atkins in 1712 for his book The Ancient and Present State of Gloucestershire and they generally show a gentleman's seat but and the surrounding gardens but they also have lots of other detail as well and you've not looked at them they are they are fantastic things so these are just a couple here and I just this one's Fairford and the other one is um, Hill which is down in the south of the county and you can see that you know the, the effort that was put into drawing these and, and the layout of the gardens got one here this is Hardwick Park Court just outside of Gloucester um, and you can see you know beautiful gardens drawn but look at the detail on the front the people walking around as well so you know if you've not looked at these prints they are they are really really good I thoroughly recommend them some of the houses are different now some have been knocked down some don't exist and we'll see that a little bit later but generally you know they give you a good idea of what these houses looked like at the time Garden plans, um, surprisingly, not too many plans survive. And this is one from part of the gardens of Hatherup Castle by 1879. Um, it's not the whole garden, it's on one side. So there were gardens around the whole of the castle on the east and northeast, but this was the Italian garden on the west side of the property. Um, it's a rectangular parterre, which just is a posh word for a planned formal garden. Um, had two terraces and you can steps leading down there. There's formal beds and gravel pathways. And on the map here, on, on as you can see, this garden was the one um, where it says fountain, you can see on the sort of the left-hand side of the castle. Um, what's interesting about this particular plan is it not only shows out the layout of the garden and the planting, but it also gives the actual plants itself. Now, they're not included in this image because they're top right corner and it's made the other thing too small. But this is something that we don't normally get. We don't normally get the planting plans of them. We get the drawings of where it's all going to go, but not what they are. And in this one had several plants, the ones noted, mostly cotton asters uh, with alpine heaths, Oregon grapes, and another one, and I can't read that one because my taskbar has come up and blocked it. Um, but yeah, this is great. So we know now what was growing there and it would have been like most modern gardens these things are going to be repeated around so that would have been a really nice garden to visit um, you can't visit it today it's, it's a private school um, this is another interesting plan, but we know very, very little about it. It's marked as Sir James's garden, um, and it's from the Lloyd Baker family of Hardwick Court archive, and specifically the papers of John Sharp, the Archbishop of York. Um, but it doesn't appear to be his directly, and it's more likely to be something to do with James Sharp, who was the engineer, inventor, and ironmonger, and the abolitionist Granville Sharp's brother. Now, we know he had several houses that he bought and did up, and we're pretty sure that this plan probably went with one of these houses, but say, so unfortunately, we can't, we can't be sure. But as you can say, it's a beautiful plan, very geometric, very nicely shaped. Um, it reminds me of the garden, one of the big gardens in, in Devon, actually, you can go down to visit. It looks a bit like that. Um, former gardens get often laid down to the plan down to the last detail. Um, and this is a lovely little flower bed, which was done, done at Dur Durham Park down in the south of the county. But again, sadly for this one, we don't have any idea of the plants that were used. We know its size, so there's a scale there, so we know how big it's going to be. But they're just, we just don't have an idea of the plants that were, that were put in there. Presumably, it looks like the grey blotches were sort of some sort of shrub. Um, and presumably it's bedding plants, but you know, as to what was growing in the middle, we just don't know. Sadly, we probably will never know.
But this sort of work often required input from the sort of the famous garden landscape gardeners of the time, landscape capability of Brown, William Ems, William Kent, John Webb, and uh, to name but a few. Uh, and we do have, you know, we have definitely sort of work from capability Brown in Gloucestershire. That, that's quite well known. And we'll look at some of it in a moment. Not all these garden plans are posh, and this is more like my garden. Um, this is a garden plan and a diary written by a gentleman called Arnold Whitehouse for Church Down, sort of First World War up to about 1940s. Um, and he planned this garden in meticulous, if admittedly rather scrappy detail. And he kept detailed gardening diaries, giving planting, harvest dates and yields. As an example on the right there, you can see for 1932. Got a lot of stuff in there. And here's a plan on the left for 1917. Um, you know, and there's a lot of food he's growing here but of course this was the time of the war when food was really starting to get short now in world war one and of course the rationing was introduced in 1918 um but you know it is a pre it's sort of a pre heralder of the dig for victory in world war ii which we'll look at in a moment um you know and he's growing quite a lot of lovely crops there you know it's there's the it's beans, carrots, potatoes, early and late ones, cabbages, uh, like the difference between old cabbages and new cabbages there, rhubarb, some herbs, turnips, you know, so he's grown a lot of stuff there to help, help keep the family going. You do get plants of gardens in the estate surveys, but they generally far less detailed. So this is an example from a survey in, of an estate in Morton in the Marsh. Um, and so the survey has gone through, it's given the size of it, of the various places, but you can see it's just marked the house is in red, it's two yards and a garden, that's all you're gonna get. And sadly, a lot of it is often like that. So you don't have any idea of the layout or what was going on there. And um, Gotto Gardens, we have a few of these in Gloucestershire, they're sort of based on artificial decorative simulations of natural caves and, and they've been a recurring feature in the history of the Western Garden since, since the times of the Romans. Um, the origins go back to the Greeks where the natural and man-made caves were used for this sort of thing, for living and ritual usages. Uh, and they're generally formed in areas of limestone geology where the acidity of standing water dissolves the limestone carbonates in the rock and what's small fissures opens up to larger ones but having said that many are man-made and this is an example of one at Bedford House in Chipping Camden uh, you know they're very often planted quite wildly to you know make it look natural and artificial and wild. Um, in Gloucestershire we've got quite a few nice ones the one picture there is from Hidcut and I went up there last year and those stones are exactly the same same uh, feature and um, there's one at Hynham and also there's a couple of nice ones at Batsford which we'll look at in a moment. So this is the Hermit's Cave at Batsford. If you've not been to Batsford, thoroughly I reckon you do. It's a great little estate to walk around with the Arboretum. And it's developed by Alton and Freedom Mitford um, after 1886. He travelled wildly, wildly, widely, I'd say, in Asia. And he liked the idea of this sort of their planting they did so he created this wild landscape inspired by Chinese and Japanese practice and as part of that he built this really lovely 600 meter long water course which runs down the western side of the garlands gardens and encompasses such features as this these hermits cave and there's rockeries a thatched that cottage a Japanese rest house with a rooftop dragon which is great um, and there's a couple of grottos in it one very close to water so you know they're really interesting things and I think the skill in them is they sort of look haphazard but you know they're not they actually are planned and built and um, water gardens uh, it's a broad term can you apply to any garden that makes use of water for ornamental effect either in cascades pools or decorative canals and of course we've got several of these in Gloucestershire Stanway gardens with a massive water fountain that comes on every now and then um, that's worth seeing but obviously the most impressive one is the Westbury Court garden um, it's one of its facts the only surviving 17th century Dutch water garden in the UK and again if you've not been there recently I thoroughly recommend you you, you go there. Um, originally laid out quite early, 1696 to 1705 by Maynard Colchester. He designed the long canal, the pavilion at the back, a circular pond and the framework of walls. So, you know, he'd seen this and become in inspired by it or the house that he lived in is no longer there is it on this, this map. It's just to the, it's on the, actually the orchard section here. Um, but, you know, he built it and really great and we've got it today, but you know, times changed and by the 1700s, these sort of formal gardens had, had 
gone out of fashion. They're replaced by natural landscape gardens, such as those done by Capability Brown and what the larger house of the gentry would like. Um, this is a picture by, again by Johannes Kip of Westbury Court Garden. Um, you know, you can see the size. You know, and this, uh, how big it was. There's the, the canals in the middle there by the house, um, and there's the ponds either side. But look at the orchards around it. And what I always find fascinating with these is, you know, these these big gardens were designed for growing food as well as pleasure. So you've got lots of flowers being grown there, as well as fruit, you know, going alongside the walls and vegetables. The canals were also stocked with fish, so you could have fresh meat, fresh fish for the table, and there's a warren there, for rabbits to breed, to supply food there. So they really did think about these things, you know, how are we going to make it, as well as looking really attractive and very, very posh, I can show off to my friends, but, you know, I want to help it actually keep the household going. The landscape garden, which was so, so famous, um, they emerged in the 1700s, replacing the more sort of symmetrical formal gardens of the, the French style and the Italian style that were popular in the 1600s. Um, really only available to the top gentry due to the cost and the scale of these. The classic English landscape garden, it's got a lake, wide sweeping vistas with gently rolling lawns set against tree backgrounds. And there's loads of other things, recreations of classical temples, Gothic rooms, ruins in there, follies, that sort of thing, bridges, and lots of other picturesque architecture, all designed to recreate a sort of idyllic pastoral landscape. Uh, and uh, the big country houses such as Badminton, Dirham, and uh, Doddington, uh, you know, they have this in, in, in exemplifier. Um, you can go abroad, like Barrington in Herefordshire's got it as well. You know, there's, there's some really good stuff here. Um, the most famous designer, Lancelot Capability Brown, who worked on several Gloucestershire Estates, Badminton being the most famous. And you can see this beautiful view up to the house. You know, this is the sort of thing the Lord, the Lord of Duke of Beaufort's going to love. You know, he's going to look up and look how far all my land goes. So there's some, re some really nice, interesting stuff and design in this. Again, this is a look at the gardens by Kip. Um, you know, they're huge. I've never been to Badminton House, not even with the horse trials, even though I'm sure they're all fine guilty. But yeah, it's a good joke. Um, but, you know, look at the scale of this. This is, you know, only the very, very rich can afford this, for sure. Uh, other things as well, like not just landscape, the gardening. Um, before refrigeration, the only way to cool things was to use ice. So most of these big country houses had ice houses to store ice all year round. Um, the ice house at Doddington was designed by Capability Brown, and this is the plan of it. Um, very interesting thing. Um, it's built of bricks, got a dome on it, but along with these lime kings and brick ovens that were also built to help build houses, um, these sort of things were built into landscape gardening, usually disguised or out of sight or decorative. You know, so you know, basically you can see them there, they've got a good use, but they're not going to intrude into the design too much. The one here at Doddington um, was very clever, so it's a brick built dome at the top, the ice was poured in, kept it cold. It had a thatched roof, which could be wetted in the summer to enhance the cooling, so it keeps the ice going all year round. So fascinating things. And the picture at the bottom, the map there, is again from Doddington, and you can see it's got a lime kiln there and a brick kiln. You know, these things were useful and they were there, we're near close to the water and the resources, such as the clay, but again, they're disguised. They're kept out of the way of the main view of the house. I mentioned earlier on about this is a this is a sort of thing only the really posh could afford. Um, this is a bill for landscape garden and work at Durham, indicated by C. Harcourt Masters, who was a fair and architect in Bath, but sort of dabbled in landscape gardening, I believe. Um, this is for the William Blathway of Durham in Old money, £277, seven shillings and sixpence. It's about £22,000 today, so that's an awful lot of money. And this isn't the only example, there's lots more of these sort of receipts, as it were, old notices in the in the archive. Um, so this would have been one of a series of things. And you can't really, really see it in there, but, you know, it's quite detailed. They're making roads, making banks, etc. There's a lot of work going on here. Um, once you've got your landscape garden, of course, you know, you've got to maintain it and the ongoing gardening costs could be very, very high as well for the gentry. So this is a, another one from Doddington. Um, 
This is what it includes, labour, wages, seeds, nails, travelling expenses for people coming and going, sea potatoes, baskets, trenching, which is like clearing ditches, cleaning the ponds, which in this particular year is only eight months of the year, but done twice. Uh, twine, for example, packing paper for saving all the fruit and stuff that's grown, blacksmith work, and there's a couple of sundries. I mean, if they're not nails, I don't know what are. Uh, but, you know, this account, January to September, comes to about 116 pounds, about 7,000 pounds today. So, you know, you can see these families had to have a high income coming in to be able to afford all these luxuries that they did. Um, Rococo Gardens or Garden, um, Rococo sort of period of art that was fashionable in Europe in the 1700s and characterised by sort of ornamental decoration, pastel colours and a symmetry it went totally the other way from the formal gardens and blended the two really with the landscape gardening. Um, the upper middle classes couldn't afford to match the great landscape parts of the landed gentry, so they opted for smaller, more flamboyant gardens, characterised by this irregular shapes, asymmetry, fanciful orientation with eclectic buildings. And of course, you know, the Rococo Garden up at Painsbury because the only surviving complete example. And again, if you've not been to it, I thoroughly recommend you do it. It's a great walk. Um, it's good any time of the year. Spring is allegedly the best when you've got the snowdrops and everything and the primroses coming out. But it's great at any time of the year. So you've got here, this, it's in a valley, so it's odd straight away. The house is at the top. There's a lake at the bottom, you know, and it's just a gently sort of curved day. And you've got fruit beds, you've got vegetable plots as well as flowers. These sort of the, uh, the art deco building there not the art deco but the decorated building there and it's a thoroughly great place and it gives you an idea of sort of what the sort of upper middle classes could do if they put their mind to it uh, kitchen gardens, I love these. Every country house, big, medium, small, had some form of kitchen garden, and they were highly productive plots supplying food, herbs, and flowers to the households. And this is a picture of the one at the map, of the one at Doddington, um, a little bit away from the house. You know, you didn't want to see it; it's kept out of the way. Others are normally at the back of the houses. Um, they typically had big high walls surrounding them, providing protection from pests and the elements, really. So there's a lot, a lot about them. There's lots of different types. They typically had vegetable beds in the centre, fruit around the outside, and then numerous greenhouses and buildings for storage and work. Um, you know, one of the best examples in the UK is the Heligan, Lost Gardens of Heligan, where there's some massive ones, but also at Barrington, just across the border. It's a really interesting sort of it's got a, a big square kitchen garden plus a circular one, which is really interesting. So I thoroughly recommend you visit that as well. All the National Trust, obviously. But these these are great. Um, not so visible on the maps because it's very difficult to tell what's a wall and what isn't. But uh, these two, for examples, definitely are walled ones. And um, of course, you know, as part of that, you had the medicinal physic gardens, critical for usage in medicines. Every kitchen garden had something somewhere where these plants that were grown. Um, and, you know, and they were used in the recipes, you know, for the cures in the household. So there are lots of things being grown, mainly herbs, admittedly, but, you know, roses, lavenders, poppies, mints, hops, foxgloves, hundreds of more things were grown. Uh, and, and, you know, and then they were used to make medicines for the whole household. The, for the itch, by the way, um, if you know, itches um, the little mite that gets under the skin, scabies, basically. So there's lots of treatments for it. We've got some nice ones and the egg and the treatment to cure an egg at the bottom. Egg was probably malaria, a, a local malaria. Um, greenhouses, funny enough, the concept of greenhouses originated in the Roman times, but the first true ones didn't appear till the 1400s in Korea, where the Koreas had used an underfloor heating and then they got this idea of putting glass on it to keep it warm. By the 1600s, the idea had spread to Netherlands and England, and the first actual stove heated greenhouse was at the Chelsea Physic Garden in 1681 um, in order to grow sort of sensitive medicinal plants. And again, if you've not been to the Chelsea Physic Garden, I can thoroughly recommend it. It's a really good visit. Um, However, they were quite expensive greenhouses, primarily due to the glass. Making of panes of glass was quite complicated and quite difficult. Um, so they initially became common in the larger gentry properties where they could grow exotic fruits and vegetables. Pineapples was a, a, one of the popular ones. Um, if you look at them on maps today, on the Ordnance Survey maps, they're usually shown as cross hatching. In the first edition, which you can see at the top here, the, the coloured maps, they're great because they're blue with the cross hatching. So you can see there's two, three, Three, four, five, six greenhouses there on this garden. Um, subsequent ones, they just 
tend to they drop the colour sadly, but they're a little bit harder to spot. But they, you know, you'll see how much glass and greenhousing there is actually done there. It's amazing. They came in all shapes and sizes, freestanding ones to lean-to ones like this one. We don't know exactly where this was, but we know it's from around Chipping Camden as well. That's where the photographer lived. Um, but they were, and they still are, quite expensive items for a garden. Um, and so was replacing the planes of grass, which were broken. I'm sure everyone of us who's kicked a football in a garden near a greenhouse has broken a bit of glass at some point or other. Um, and this is a nice little document from the Hewlett State Miranda book price of glasswork at the greenhouse uh, three pounds four shillings no pence they've estimated here about 245 pounds today so again quite a substantial sum for the glass that they're going to be putting in I'm going to mention about oranges. There was sort of a room or dedicated building on the grounds of upper-class houses from the 1600s to the 1800s, and they were simply used to sort of orange and fruit trees were protected in them during the winter. So it'd be a case of you put them out in the summer, bring them into the orangery in the winter to keep them going. Um, there's several in Gloucestershire. Frampton Court's got one. Doddington House is the most famous in Hynham Court. And the pictures here of Doddington House, um, and uh, he's currently the owner of the Dyson, isn't he? He's got into trouble because he dug up the middle of that and put a swimming pool in there uh, and he's had to apply for retro plan and permission and everything. But it's a, it's a beautiful building um, yeah, and you obviously won't get to see it, sadly, but there are some images on the Internet. But they're, they're similar in concept to greenhouses and kitchen garden walls that they simply provide protection from the elements, but they were a bit easier to heat and more efficiently because they were part of the main house usually. So they would take some of the warmth from that. But say. Have they said that the drawback expensive to build high status so they were did become a sort of a status symbol um showing you know this is how much i can sort of afford interestingly the one at Heinen court was quite it's quite modern it's only 20 years old though it looks a lot older vineries again a variant of the greenhouse and the orangery um and the, the best example in the county really is dr jenner's house uh, there is one built at the rear of the trantry and you can see it here on the right hand side of this picture um you know jenner's example glass brick and stone the walls were designed to gather heat and also had a central heating system for the cold winter months and as well as grapes for a minute he also grew pineapples in there i believe that's a big big thing um Interesting with Janet, he planted a black Hamburg grape from the great vine of Hampton Court, and two of them are still alive today. And this is a view of the inside of the actual vinery. And it's again, it's a lovely building to go into. If you've not been to the house, thoroughly recommend it. Um, what's interesting about this one, 2018, a local brewer, Mills Brewing, picked grapes from this, added it to a, a single barrel red burgundy wine barrel with beer in it, two-year-old pale ale. They created the limited edition 200 bottles, Dr. Jenner's Muscat Vine. I say the last one was sold for 2020 for £160. Again, I can't see it because of this thing here, but you know, sadly I never got to drink that, but I bet it tasted lovely. A quick look at the garden livestock. Um, most common ones, poultry, basically, poultry, chickens, geese and turkeys at the right time of year. Um, you know, you're going to keep them. They are, they, are, they are handy. You get free eggs and you've got your meat, followed by rabbits, pigs, the occasional goats. Although goats tend to be more trouble than they're worth in a garden simply because they eat everything they can. Um, but bees were also, again, quite common, especially had a sort of middle sized garden. And then quite a few beekeepers were around then. The most common, obviously, the pigs, um, the Gloucestershire old spot pig, where would be without them, uh, originated in the Vale of Barclay, uh, Vale of Gloucester, probably around the Barclay area, there's we're not, not too many records early in the 1900s of them, um, but they were nicknamed the Orchard Pig, they are friendly calm little beasts, uh, they live happily on very little land, so they're ideally suited to the orchards and paddocks in the Vale, you know, munching on the apples. Um, they're the oldest spotted, ped oldest pedigree spotted pig in the world, um, and when found in the society of Gloucester Old Spot Society in 1913, so not that long ago, the chairman said that locals could remember that over 50 years ago the old spot was around even then, which of course is nothing really, it only takes it back to the 1850s, there or thereabouts, but we know they've been around probably since the 14, 1500s. Um, local red legend, the spots of them are caused by apples falling onto their backs, giving them bruises, hence the spots, which I love. 
Um, Sales particulars are a good way to reveal where gardens are, um, but they generally have very little detail apart from the inclination of how productive they were. Of course, they try to sell a property, so you're not going to say it's a miserable garden, nothing grows there. And these are two good examples. Um, so on the left hand side, we've got the Stevens Green property. And if you read down on the lot one, it's got a productive walled garden. Um, the Maysmore Lodge estate here on the right, you know, they've actually highlighted this. It's got a large and productive garden. So this is what they're going to be saying all the time to try and persuade you to actually buy these properties. Um, so looking at some flowers, um, lovely picture of this hollyhock, hollyhock which is grown at Long Hope in 1961. I can't get hollyhocks to grow in my garden, I'd love to, but around my estate they're everywhere, for some reason they don't like my garden, but uh, RHS said you know, typically grow to about two and a half meters. That's the mass. I think this one is probably near a three, so it probably beat it. Um, you know, it's a shame they never sort of sent the picture to the RHS at the time. Uh, and then we see got the smaller cut flowers. These are two orchids, probably grown by a, a Captain George F. Moore of Borton on the Water. Um, no, we don't know anything about the species, sadly. Uh, if anybody knows, it'd be nice to, if you could let us know. But we know that it's got to be in that area um, because they come from the collection of Jesse Taylor of Chipping Camden, who is a photographer and clockmaker. And he actually says that they are grown by George F. Moore of Borton on the Water. But, you know, I don't recognise the species, but then again, I'm not like a cot on flowers, to be honest. Uh, people have always liked drawing and painting flowers. A um, couple of pictures here from Miss Anne Hill, who published a book on them. The other one can publish it, she drew it. Um, we know the one on the right is the uh, is spiny rest harrow. Um, the other two, the one on the left is a geranium species, and there's a buttercup species, species there. But you know, wonderful artwork in these. You know, they really are really joys to behold. The big one on the right hand side, the spiny rest harrow, you might recognize from the uh, Heritage Hub Garden, if you walk along the passageway, we've got a big, big picture of it there. Um, these aren't the new ones. These are flowers, beautiful watercolours by Mary Baker, uh, who was part of the Lloyd Baker family. Um, she painted several botanical watercolours quite early on. We've got some of them in, in a book. We'll see if something else she did later. But again, I think you'll agree, these are wonderful little pictures of flowers. Flower pressing, very popular hobby in Victorian and Edwardian times. Um, this is a, just a one page of press Swiss flowers and ferns from a, a book belonging to Alice Spencer. Um, dates to the late 1800s. We don't know too much about it, but um, it's from the sort of Chalford Hill County Primary School archive. And it looks like she was a teacher there. And she was the person who did this lovely picture I've used at the start of this talk. And here, there are several drawings in this book like this, and they're really wonderful. But it's also, again, she'd like to press some flowers. And we do have some other pressed flowers in the archive as well. Going back to Mary Baker, as well as flowers, she also painted apples. Um, you know, these beautiful images she's done, and as well as painting them, she corresponded with local experts on apples, and they all exchanged hints and cultivation of types of varieties, you know, identifying specimens. Uh, and again, there's several of these that we have images of. Um, and again, thanks to the Gloucestershire Orchard Trust, lots of these local varieties still survive. And you can still eat them. The most popular one is the one here, the Ashmead kernel. Now we've got an Ashmead kernel tree grown in the archives. My personal favourite is the other one, the Little Herbert. I love that one. Um, but, you know, they are really nice apples. However, would you want to eat a hen's turd? Probably not, but apparently cook it right, it's fine. Um, nurseries. Um, Nurseries is a plant growing thing. They've been around for quite some time. Um, one of the most famous ones was the J.D. Wheeler's a nursery in Gloucester, started a nursery in Gloucester in 1750, and it continued as a nursery until 1853 in the hands of one of his sons till it was sold off. Um, but, you know, it's been around selling places, selling plants to everybody. This is, again, sent to plants sent to uh, Cheltenham, Hewlett's. Uh, in the little list of plants there, he's growing, basically, and the customer's bought. Excuse me a second. Yeah, so again, recognise the name. It's, it's where the site of one of his nurseries was where the archives is today, where the Heritage Hub is. But he also owned other nurseries around Gloucester on the north side. When John Jeffries and Sunday were in Sirencester, founded in 75, produced many local varieties. And I love this one, the Cotswold Pixie Sprout. 
The advantage of this sprite, according to their blurb, was the fact that it didn't grow as high as most other sprites. So it had it was close to the ground, so it didn't get damaged by the wind. Um, I'd love to know if this was still extant today. I suspect it's not, but we don't know. But as well as plants, they also were nursery for trees. And so they would actually grow trees and move them. And this wonderful picture shows Jeffrey's team moving a conifer, mature conifer tree, using a thing called a barren tree transporter, which was invented purposely to move these trees and it was like a big grab that would actually dig the tree out of the ground and they'd move it by a tractor. We have lots and lots of seed suppliers and catalogues in the archives. These are just a random selection so all local ones so you know you've got wheelers which we know Winfields is local, Walter Purvis and Hume were local and so were human cousins presumably they sort of Hume disappeared and they sort of set up different things they tend to spit a lot of nurseries I've, I've heard um, but yeah so lots of these and inside these of course you've got lots of local varieties of, of plants that were being grown you know space precludes listing them it's just too many sadly council nurseries at one time most local authorities ran their own nurseries and maintained them and this is a lovely plan for a new pitfield nursery complete with greenhouses hot and cold frames for Cheltenham Borough Council in 1962. The scheme did go ahead um, but it was later sold off as with most things councils now decide to buy their material in so they sell off these things and this is now the site of the old nurseries down by sort of the Kingditch uh, very lower Cheltenham Road on the way towards Coombe Hill. It's still there, there's a garage above it and there's a timber yard next to it I think now, but the actual site is still the same. Um, school gardens, um, you know, it was they, most school gardening activities were really liked and enjoyed by pupils because it got them out of the classroom, basically. Um, typically, school gardens were the realm of the rural science class, lower stream pupils. And I know because I was one of those and I thoroughly enjoyed my two years doing rural science. I absolutely loved it. And I was so disappointed when he couldn't take it up in the third year. Um, but these pictures, great pictures, come from Chalford School in the early 1900s to show children tending the vegetables. You've got the boys on the right hand side there looking a bit more more active. I got a feeling the picture on the right, it looks like a posed picture of some sort. The girls don't really look like they're in their everyday school gear to me. They look like quite posh. So maybe it was a special occasion. But I remember we really enjoyed it. And I, you know, when I, I'd love to have been a farmer at the time. And that suited me down to the ground doing that. Garden centres, because now today, modern days, most nurseries have such have morphed into the garden centre, so they'll be selling lots of things, teas, coffee, as well as plants and things like that. Um, well, the early one was Hurrens of Churchdown, which was originally the Churchdown Nurseries, rebranded itself in about 67. Uh, it for a time um you know it's times changed sadly it's not there now it's under church down tesco but again it was a very big site had other extensive nurseries where they grew the materials to plants to take to the nursery site and there's some of those are up at um lake hampton here there are some of those there um but again you know this is how we sort of tend to see our plants now the garden centers rather than the nursery looking at garden work um gardeners work is never done so i'm sure you're Things such as Edward Budding's lawnmower have helped thousands of us over the years. And there's a lovely picture from Chipping Camden of a, an early mechanical uh, petrol lawnmower. It looks like a Suffolk punch to me from the design, but it, no, it might be a budding. Um, but larger estates, they needed grain stuff. And again, this is a, a lovely picture from the Doddington Park Estate in 1890. So this is all the outside labourers. So you've got a head gardener, you've got the head keepers, you've got seven you know helpers woodsmen everything so each had their own role and there are a lot of people to work and they were sort of looked after and worked on the estate um first horticultural societies started in the 1830s and uh, gloucester hadn't before cheltenham did expanded to cyrus and then cheltenham followed suit um the cheltenham horticultural and floral society registered with the rhs in 1832 and you know very successful meetings they then merged with the zoological garden in Cheltenham, which is one, if I remember right, at Pitville Park. And so it was renamed the Gloucestershire Zoological, Botanical and Horticultural Society. It's a bit of a mouthful. I suspect there's lots of internal politics going as it reformed a bit later is the Cheltenham and County of Gloucestershire Royal Horticultural Society and of course lots of other garden clubs exist and we've got records of you know quite a few of them, um, you know, stride ones, all sorts like that. 
Um, however, one of the most important societies, <coughs> he would not, was the Gloucestershire Pig and Potato Committee, Production Committee, founded in 1918 by Charles Bathurst at the end of the First World War, essentially all to do with uh, uh, rationing again. So it formed in order to try and promote pig domestic backyard pig and potato production to try and offset the food shortages that were going on. Um, it, it expanded quite quickly, then contracted dramatically, reconstituted in World War II as the Gloucestershire Home Food Production Society, um, basically to extend the scope of it and become part of the Dig for Victory campaign, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. <clears throat> and interestingly, with the Dig for Victory campaign, this is the, the brochure in the middle is a list of books from the local libraries saying these books, if you don't know anything about gardening, read these books and they'll help you. Um, when will you have garden as results? This is one another lovely photograph from the Jesse Taylor um, collection. So it's probably somewhere in Chipping Camden. Of all, you know, this is the Harvest Festival. You know, I'm, I'm sure we all remember them from school. They were wonderful things to go to. And you can make out lots of cut flowers here. And there's lots of vegetables on the front row. Mostly it looks like potatoes and onions with a few carrots scattered around. But, you know, <clears throat> If you can go to any of the harvest festivals, obviously they're still held on very often. Um, the RHS one at Malvern is great to go to, especially for the enormous vegetable section, which is great fun. Um, annual garden shows, usually held at the local church fete. Hotbeds of a competition renowned for being really conflict ridden and troublesome. You know, people really take these things very, very seriously. And if somebody's leaked, didn't get a first prize because other persons did, yeah, it can end up stopping all, all years' communication. You just got to be really got out the judges basically but again they're lovely things to go go and see especially societies like this is a strand because that's the society i don't know if it still exists it might do but you know imagine the society so big it had its own show you know it's very impressive and um, garden theft, you know, plants in gardens were, and they still are in some cases, targeted by thieves. Um, this is a conviction, not, it's a very rough one, I'm afraid. It's a conviction of John Matthews in October 1833 for stealing four plants, they're not named, from a garden of William Halford. This is in Cheltenham. Um, he was fined five shillings with five shillings sixpence cost, about £40 today. So he was fined. Another one here, George Cox stealing pea plants um, off William Long in Cam in 1830. He received one calendar month's hard labour in Horsley House of Correction. So, you know, that would have left his family in dire straits if he wasn't working. Um, garden dangers. You know, we think gardens are places to relax, and, you know, feel safe. But if you look at this image here, this is a gardener who's been shot through a hedge. So the guy on the other side of the hedge shooting is saying, you know, can you hand me a little bird I've just shot? But obviously you can see it's hit, the, as well as killing the bird, it's hit the gardener. Uh, and it's also hit the uh, fire, pot, fire pot there. And there's greenhouses there. So this is, you know, luckily we don't have guns in gardens anymore. Um, I look at, looked at some of the ROSPA figures, Royal Society for Protection of Accidents yesterday, and around 300,000 people each year visit hospital with a garden injury related of some sort. Um, the uh, most common injury is a fall, but the most threat if you're actually gardening is a cut, then then falls, then being struck by things. You know? And the most dangerous in, implements are lawn mowers followed by flower pots, believe me. Then you get the secateurs, spades and hedge trimmers. So you've got to be careful in the garden. And that brings us to the end of the talk today. Um, don't ignore the bottom, the bottom line here. I just suddenly realised I haven't got the right uh, talk on, but I couldn't change it in time. So our next talk is, will be the 20th of December, but it will be our Frontiers and Pioneers, um, which will, again, it will be looking at all the inventions that have been we found in Gloucestershire over the years. So again, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, happy to take questions via the chat now, if that's OK. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, John. That was excellent, as always. So, and I'll just, uh, as you uh, make your comments, I shall um, read those out to John. So let's have a look. What have we got? Oh, <laughs> so David um, Jones is saying that Maysmore Lodge is now called Maysmore Park. And the current day Maysmore right. Lodge is a modern house. And mm. such renaming can cause confusion if not realised. Um, uh, Maysmore School was famous for its gardening. Refer the book P P Pigs and Poetry by Fiona Mead. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and the district Strand District Chrysanthemum Society. Um, the club still meets going. at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings in the membership. Wow, that's so brilliant. it is still going. 
Uh, we, well, we'll have to, we'll have to, if you, if you go to them, please ask them, you know, we'll still take their, their, their sort of records, you know, we'd love this sort of thing, it'd be fantastic. He, he says Brilliant. he fell off a ladder and broke several ribs, and there are more of his comments further up. That's okay, I think David's reposted, so. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, that's, that's good. Oh, thank you, David. Um, uh, oh, so, yeah. So, I, I oh, <laughs> so comment roughly 309.5 million years ago. Yeah, right. he's impressed by your accuracy there. Uh, so, well, I thank the British, British, British Geological <laughs> Survey for that. And then, and, uh, well, they can date it quite accurately, amazingly enough, because of the various bands and they can compare fossils. So it's, uh, you know, they're, reason they're reasonable, but it does vary according to where you are as well. But the, yeah, the, I, I, I noticed about the David kip drawing wonderful it must have had a drone yeah i mean how how he could envisage that from the, that height because they're all grown like he's say he's got a drone on a massive step ladder you know so they are really really good drawings and i can only imagine how they did it they surveyed it in quite detail and then he sort of uses imagination to look up i will see this at this angle so he was a very skilled engraver so that's probably why so we've got is this from you eileen um, from Alan to everyone, zoological gardens in Chel and Chelton were in the park, not the park, not Pitville Park. It's now part of the University of Gloucestershire. Oh, so down there were. Of course, I was. I just, as, a, as a, I mean, as I remember all this, the animal cages at the Pitville Park side of it. So I didn't. I, I just assumed they were there. I hadn't realised they were down at the actual university side. That's interesting. Yeah, I would have thought oh, that yeah. too, because as you say, yeah. at Pitville Park, they they have all the um, like the zoo cages, don't they? And yeah, yeah. I don't know if they're still yeah. there. Yeah, the, I know the 1884 time map will be good Good for looking at things. Probably the 1850 Old Town Survey would be very interesting as well, which, again, you can find that on Know Your Place. If you've not looked at Know Your Place, the free mapping service with a comparative slider, that's worth looking at. So there's the 1850 uh, Old Town Survey of Cheltenham on there. So that would be interesting to look at as well. Hello? Hello. Can I speak to John? John? Uh, I, I, hello. I was very interested in the greenhouses. Um, at the end of my old garden, in my old house, yeah. was uh, a greenhouse identical to the one that you showed, absolutely identical. Oh, right. And so... leaning against the wall, now the wall was a Cotswold stone wall, which was then lined with red brick. Yeah. And painted that... white. Yeah. And not only that, it was on a slope. Of course, very complicated. Because it attracted the sun, so it yeah. wasn't horizontal. But yeah. inside was an enormous plant stand, beautiful plant stand. Now, the, ho the house I was living in was owned by the, the, um, uh, the Lorbo people. The, um, oh, Buddings? Uh, I've forgotten the name. I haven't seen you a moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> But That's however, not like you, Maureen. I, I feel sure that they made this plant stand. Oh, I regret to say, when I moved, I took it with me. Oh, so well, I wasn't still it? Got it. <laughs> no, it's it has, good. It has great big lion feet. Oh, wow. Enormous. But this idea of the wall sloping really interesting yeah i think you say i think if i remember right, it's, it's again it's your design to try and get the maximum amount of sun right so it keeps helps keeping it warm sort of thing but that's right I, yeah i think on some of them they actually do have like um, if it's a heated one they can have um, air furnaces in the bottom you know furnace or well, air passages in the bottom so they can light a fire in a furnace outside and it sucks the air through you know at, at the bottom so then it raises up so someone know have got sort of air two years i think they're called sort of channels where the, the hot air will go through that's really interesting Maureen. Brilliant. and the other thing in the same area um more court which was of course mugmore originally yeah has a very good um estate plan very good oh, really? good one but the yeah. great thing is we still have the photographs to uh. the groundwork of the because the, the chap who did that garden was the top pupil of Paxton. Oh, right, OK. Oh, so that's, that's... they are fabulous. There are about six different greenhouses, all for different things, pine houses and so on yeah. and so on. Oh, that's and really interesting. Unfortunately, they took photographs before they actually even got rid of the foundations. Oh, and we cool. have copies of those, which 
would go very nicely with the estate plan. Yeah, yeah. Because they were very, he's a very special man who wrote books, the man mm. who did it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's it's. I've heard the name sort of thing. That's really interesting to know that. It's really good. We've got some, you know, because I'm sure you could probably do a dissertation on green houses in Gloucestershire alone, I would imagine. So that's really interesting. Your stuff. subject is so wide, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. wide. Yeah, I mean, it's like with the kitchen gardens. I mean, oh, I love these stately homes, kitchen gardens. I, I, I really adore them. I think they're fantastic. It's so interesting how they were laid out and why things went where and everything, you know. So, you know, and it's the same thing. You find these, uh, it's like the greenhouses at this Chelsea Physic Garden. They are really fascinating because they're really early ones. You yeah. know, they've been revamped a few times, but they've kept some originals and they're fascinating to look at. You know, it's really good. I mean, I might not know too much about flowers, but I love looking at the, the walled gardens and the, and the greenhouses. More mechanical, I suppose, but <laughs> but it's really good. Thank you, Maureen. Really interesting. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. Uh, oh, hang on. Um, here we are. So this is from Alan, which I think is, is Eileen, Alan. Uh, I believe that the Chapman Nursery is an old Gloucester Road that you've showed have now closed and the land is going for housing. The allotments oh, right. are still there, and I think that I was going to actually say that I think that those nurseries have closed, haven't they? Oh, right. And um, yeah, and it's the house, and it's been sold for oh, lots shame, of houses are planned to. I remember the last yeah. time I went down there, I haven't been that way for maybe a year and a half, two years. I remember they were sort of there, but they looked a bit derelict um, at the time. So that's a real shame. Again, it's the same with everything, isn't it? And I, I would have thing with the allotments. Um, I was going to put it, some stuff on the allotments, but amazingly, we don't have a huge amount of material on the allotments. Um, and I know John Loosely does a lot of research on allotments, but I couldn't find a huge amount because the trouble is I'm looking for sort of fairly attractive plans and things like that. So they might be there in the archives, but I didn't find them when I was looking, sadly. So again, like everything, the beauty of the archives is always something new to learn and find out about. So, uh, you know, look out in a couple of years time for a talk on allotments, possibly. <laughs> So the next, um, oh, hang on, so we've got one from <laughs> Victoria. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. I was going to ask if you could do a presentation on the allotments of Gloucestershire. Yeah, great minds, as you say, Victoria. Again, if, you, if you're a member of a society, ask your society secretary to contact John Loosley, because I'm pretty sure he does one on allotments. I mean, they might be Stroud way, uh, Brimscombe way, but I'm sure he does, or Oak Ridge, that's where he comes from, but I'm sure he does He does them, he does a talk on allotments, but yeah. In case you don't know, Victoria, he's from the um, Gloucestershire Family History Society, so you can easily get in touch with him um, through there, or through us, if you get in touch with us, we'll be able to put you in touch. Um, you're welcome. So are we, are we done? Oh, hang, is there, I think there might be one. Nope, that's it. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, everyone, as yeah, always. So what's the date of the next talk, John? It, it is the 28th of September, isn't it? But say it's Frontiers and Pioneers, so it's not the one I put there because I was just rushing <laughs> to finish this and, and do it. So, yeah, that would be the that's just double check that because it's the fourth weekend in September and it will be, yeah, 28th September it will be. So we'll be at the uh, sort of just just come to the end of the end of the, after the history festival as well so it's linked into that because this year's Gloucester history festival is again it's on frontiers and innovation and pioneers so it's that's what it's linking into so hopefully we'll see you all again then and we will have our reminder system um operating properly but it's lovely to see you all thanks for joining us yeah and thank we'll you see you all next time okay thank you bye-bye everybody bye. cheerio